Hello and welcome to Livewire's listed series for 2024. I'm Ali Selby and today we're very lucky to be joined by Caroline Gurney, the CEO of Future Generation, for a deep dive into its funds that combine profits with purpose. Thank you so much for joining us today. Caroline, really excited to speak with you. Thanks very much, Ali, for having me. Might start off with the announcement that you made today. You recently announced a new chair, Phil Lowe. What are you hoping that he will be able to achieve at Future Generation? You're right. I mean, it was incredibly exciting to announce that, you know, Mike Baird is our current chairman and he is basically going to be stepping down um, after the AGM in May. And we've got, you know, um, Dr. Phil Lowe, um, who was obviously at the Reserve Bank. He is going to be joining as a director at, from today. And then he will take over as chair from Mike. It's a great question. Like, I think somebody with his credentials, his leadership, his experience, and also the fact that he loves the economics, obviously the macro, but he can see how that might impact people's, you know, in terms of from a social purpose point of view. So he understands the investment side, which is really important for future generation for both of our vehicles, but also the fact that we need to make a social impact. And that's what we've been talking about today. Okay, let's just wind back the clock a little bit. Can you take us behind, I guess, the beginnings of Future Generation and why it was set up in the first place? Well, it really was the vision of Jeff Wilson, who is, you know, a great advocate, not only for listed investment companies, but also for philanthropy and giving. So Jeff Wilson, he went to London, he read an article in the Financial Times, and he saw how a group of like fund managers, private equity guys were coming together to raise a lot of money seriously quickly for cancer. So he bas they basically put together this fund um, and they wanted to raise more than 500 million over time. So what they did was they got people to work pro bono, so no fees, no performance fees forever to actually manage shareholder money and they raised a lot of money for cancer. So Jeff saw that and then he thought, right, what can we do with that model in Australia? So he came back and he spoke to David Paradise, Peter Cooper, you know, the sort of the real industry gurus in investment and said, let's get together and do this. And they all did. So they all came together. Um, and now we have 18 fund managers within Future Generation Australia, which is investing in Australian equities. And then we have, you know, we've got another group of fund managers. We've got 32 fund managers for the global fund, which is Future Generation Global. So it's been a massive success and we've got more than a billion under management between the two vehicles now. And we give, you know, more than 75 million um, since inception to not-for-profits. And they're all about... Um, youth at risk and prevention of mental health issues for young people. So they're really, they're making a huge difference in Australia. And that's something that's really important to us. You said that you've um, donated $75 million since the beginning of Future Generation. What kind of impact has that had? Uh, it's really hard to quantify, but realistically, we've supported, you know, tw at the moment, we support 24 not for profits in those two different areas. And the feedback we're getting from them is that without our money, they couldn't actually do the programs they're doing to help young people. So for example, if we look at Future Generation Australia, we're supporting homelessness, we're supporting you know, children at risk, we're talking to um, organisations that basically run the mentoring in, in schools to help you know, young people cope with all the pressures that there are in day-to-day -day life. And with Future Generation Global, we've got 14 new partners working on the prevention space. And basically we're gonna be measuring their impact. So I'll be able to tell you this time next year that we've helped more than 5 million young people yeah. not go through sort of some of the stages of mental health that we're also aware of nowadays after COVID. Social impact investing and also ESG investments have really fallen off investors' radars in recent years amid rising interest rates and inflation. Why do you believe now is a time that they should take notice? I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I, I think that people need to have that sort of income and that return to them. And I think people have been really worried because there's been so much happening in global markets. People are sort of you know, worried that they just need to get a return and they haven't really necessarily been looking at sort of the wide universe. But we are, we are really about the S in ESG. So we are the social impact but we don't have a social impact ourselves. We give to not-for-profits who have the social impact, which I think is an important distinction. And I think the reason why so many shareholders like us and we want to encourage more to invest 
is the important thing is there's no fees. You know, there's no management fees. There's no performance fees from all of our amazing pro bono fund managers. Plus the board works free of charge. You know, the investment committee, you know, we have the ASX who also support us. There are so many amazing organizations that donate their time for free. And so that makes it an incredible investment because we're just taking the 1% of our total assets and giving that to the not-for-profits. Caroline, what are some of the unique strategies or fund managers that investors can get exposure to through the future generation LICs? We have a number of fund managers and they're all boutique fund managers predominantly. And that means they have skin in the game. So basically they're managing our money in their main fund, which I think is really important because this is what, you know, their bread and butter, but also what their name depends on. So we have like a different range of strategies. We have long equities, we have market neutral, you know, we have absolute bias. And we have this, we have two amazing investment committees. And basically we have, you know, the likes from Jana, we have Morningstar, we have Zenith on, on these committees. And they decide the allocation of, of who will manage up the shareholders money and what type of manager will manage the money. So I think that's really important because we really look at both of the vehicles, they are a fund of fund and they have different strategies. And we're really proud that you know, since inception, they've both had very good returns. They've always had a growing stream of dividends, but also importantly, it's always been about lower volatility in the market. And the way we do that is we have market neutral and we have cash to balance that downside as well. So to answer your question properly, I suppose, like shareholders get um, a fund of funds in a way, and they have a sort of a large exposure to whether it's the ASX um, in terms of the 500 or on the global, it's, it's small caps. Mm, question without notice, how do you avoid, I guess, any double up of holdings within those, that fund of fund structure? So basically, there is, there is a doubling of, there is definitely sort of, you know, we have some shares with certain different fund managers. But what we do have is quite a, um, it's a very active index. So to, it's, it's not as concentrated as you would think because it's mainly in the small cap skew. And because it's small cap skewed, there's so many stocks in that universe. Both of them don't have as many duplications as you would think. How does the investment committee decide how to allocate to those fund managers within the portfolios? With a lot of effort and time and analysis. So they look at all the fund managers we have, and then we basically change the allocations depending on what we need at a time. So basically we have a banding. So we don't tend to go above 10% with any fund manager. And we keep on sort of moving it slightly. So we have you know, we make sure we've got absolute bias, we make sure we've got market neutral and it's working for the times that we're experiencing. So for example, with Future Generation Global, we had a big turnover of our fund managers probably at 12 to 18 months ago. And we had to reevaluate re because the volatility, as we all know, in global markets was, was, at, you know, it was unexpected. So we had a turnover, we brought in five new fund managers and that's really had that balancing effect that we wanted for our shareholders because they want income, but they want to make sure they don't get that huge volatility. Mm, and how often would you do that? So we haven't, we, we do it as necessary. So we're always tweaking around the edges, not me, but the investment committee. And they're always sort of bringing something down from 13 to nine. You know, it's, it's a constant, you know, constant watch. How would these LICs fit within a portfolio? And do you feel like they're more suited to growth investors given there's quite a lot of small cap or equity exposure or income investors given they, they do pay those dividends? So I, I like to think it's for both. I mean, realistically, it has the investment return in terms of that growing stream of dividends. And we obviously have that capital preservation and building it over the long term. But I think the fact they also give that 1% to not-for-profits so that you know people not charged any fees, but they're paying that 1%. I think that's really incredible. So I like to think that when people look at our portfolio, you have those fund of funds. A lot of these um, funds you actually can't get into because they're closed or the, the minimum size to go in is too high. So I think for everyday investors, mums and dads, which predominantly we have, 
I think it's a, it's a really good solution to get access to so many different funds that give you a return. Mm. Both funds are paid consistent and growing dividends. Why are dividends such a big focus for future generation? I think that's, I think that's the beauty of listed investment companies. Our shareholders, when they buy into us, they understand what we're going to give them. And we want to make sure that we always deliver to what their expectations are. And we're, we're very lucky we have a profits reserve, which is basically when we can make sure that we can you know, continue to give them those dividends over time. You know, one is sort of, you know, random. so future generation Australia is approximately five years and nearly eight years for future generation global. So that money's still working for them, but they know they're going to get the dividends over time. And that's really important for the majority of our shareholders. Okay, what steps are you taking to close that discount between the share price and the NTA of both vehicles? I mean, I think across the whole of the, you know, listed investment companies at the moment, there is very much a, you know, a widening of the discounts and we're doing our utmost to make sure that we do narrow that. And I think it's very much in terms of that long-term performance, which we can, you can actually see now in both of our companies, but also to make sure that we engage with our shareholders, we speak to them regularly, and also we raise awareness of them. Um, I think all of those, and Jeff Wilson talks about at the moment that, you know, if you can buy a dollar's worth of assets at 80 cents, it's something you should be looking at. And so we really hope we'll close that over time. Have you considered a share buyback? Obviously, Ali, a share buyback is really a decision of the board. But when I was on the board of FGX, you know, Jeff Wilson, who is obviously, you know, the acknowledged leader in this area, he really does, he really believes that they don't work over the long period of time. And that realistically, you know, shareholders have to believe in what we're doing. And it's something the board does discuss. And it's something obviously they will consider, but we haven't actually seen one that's worked well over the long period of time. I mean, I think everything is going to be on the table to make sure we do actually narrow the discount because that's what we're working to. And it's the board's decision. But I also know that they want to make this work. And I think also having a new chair over time. We also have Jennifer Westercott, who's just become the chair of Future Generation Global. And this is something they're really fixated on. Thanks so much for your time today, Caroline. It was an absolute pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, Ali. If you enjoyed that too, don't forget to subscribe to LiveWire's YouTube channel. We're adding so much great content just like this every single week.